One of the last jobs I had in Yellowstone was delivering the mail on snowmobile. There I was in the world's first national park, and I remember going down into Hayden Valley. There were bison crossing over the road, 2,000 pound mammals crossing over the road, and it was so cold, it was about 60 below zero. And the bison, as they breathe, their exhalation would seem to crystallize in the air around them. And there were these sheets, these ropey strands of crystals kind of flowing down from their breath. And uh, uh, I saw them, they just moved their heads and were looking at me. And I remember thinking that if I had not been on that machine, I would have thought I had been thrust fully back into the Pleistocene, back into the Ice Age. And I remember just stopping and turning it off because the only way you could hear is to turn that thing off. And I would turn it off and I would listen. And I felt like this was the first day. And this morning was the first time the sun had ever come up. And the shadows that are being cast right now is the first time those shadows have ever been cast on the earth. And I was all alone, but I felt I was in the presence of everything around me and I was never alone. It was one of those moments when you get pulled outside of yourself into the environment around you. And I felt like I was just with the breath of the bison as they were exhaling and as I was exhaling and they were inhaling, it was all kind of flowing together. And I forgot completely about the male. All I was thinking of was that a single moment in a place as wild as Yellowstone, or most of the national parks, can last forever. Major funding for the production of the National Parks was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS stations from viewers like you. Thank you. In other parts of the world, there are certain areas that are preserved because some rich nobleman, out of the goodness of his heart, decided to decree it. But in the United States, you don't have to be dependent on some rich guy being generous to you. To me, that's what national parks mean. It's a symbol of democracy. Democracy when it works well, at its best. What's amazing about the parks is that it's so intimate. It's really about who am I? Who am I? And the parks provide this incredibly powerful force that holds ourselves up to ourselves. We are now in the mountains, and they are in us. Kindling enthusiasm, making every nerve quiver, filling every pore and cell of us. Our flesh and bone tabernacle seems transparent as glass to the beauty about us. Neither old nor young, sick nor well, but immortal. It was a perfect topic for us to deal with. I, I remember thinking of, okay, uh, we should do this series on the parks, and now I gotta convince my best friend uh, that we should do it. And I started telling him, well, it's like baseball, like jazz, it's an American invention. Its uh, first tentative expression was taken in 1864 when a president named Abraham Lincoln, and he said, okay, <laughs> we'll do it. Nobody's told the story. Um, we know which lodges to stay at. We know beautiful scenes of nature. We, we have the postcard view of this, but how did this happen? Was it really the first national park that Americans invented? Yes, it was. Um, how did it come about? Was the Park Service always there? No, it wasn't. Who made them happen? In many cases, ordinary people. A bottom-up story of people who just happened to have fallen in love with a place and were willing to devote, in some cases, their lives and their fortunes, their sacred honor, to creating a, a wonderful place that we now get to enjoy. And you have unbelievably interesting history. As we sat on logs, I began to unfold my dream for the area. 
and how I had been trying for years to save the Tetons and the whole valley north of Jackson. Mr. and Mrs. Rockefeller listened. When I finished, they remained silent as we watched the sun disappear behind the jagged peaks, casting long, sharp shadows across the valley. I felt a little let down. Here I had laid out my fondest dream, and there was no word of comment. But four months later, Albright was invited to Rockefeller's New York office to discuss the Tetons again. This time, he showed Rockefeller detailed maps and cost estimates for a modest plan to purchase some of the land near Jackson Lake. And Mr. Rockefeller had studied it quite a while, and then he shook his head and he looked up and he said, Mr. Albright, this is interesting and everything, but he said, this isn't what I meant. I want to know how much it would cost to buy that valley. And my father, I heard him so many times tell the story. And he said, and I, my heart stopped beating right then. The whole valley. This film took us really to Alaska, to the Everglades, to Hawaii volcanoes, to Acadia National Park in Maine. It's been a dream job, I mean, to be able to travel to the most beautiful places in this country and some of the most beautiful places on Earth and do it for five years and only go at the best time of year in the best light with the most incredible cooperation from the Parks Department to, uh, to make everything happen. It's just been fantastic. He's right behind you. <laughs> I remember that first moment in Santa Fe, and then later at Chaco Canyon, and then later in Yosemite in 2003, and it's been an incredibly amazing journey ever since that's taken us literally around this amazingly beautiful country of ours. Our research process is also part of our filming process. So while we're in a park, we might be filming in a park before I've written a script. And while we're there, the ranger that has showed us a particular viewpoint mentioned some story that we were unaware of, and that works its way into the script. This would be a very good time for a moose to swim across oh, right yeah. now. Well, it's been a great experience for us, not only learning history, but if you got to get up at 5 in the morning to be shooting when it's dawn rises, uh, boy, you can't pick a better place uh, to be than a national park. It is the preservation of the scenery, of the forests, and the wilderness game for the people as a whole. Instead of leaving the enjoyment thereof to be confined to the very rich, it is noteworthy in its essential democracy, one of the best bits of national achievement which our people have to their credit. And our people should see to it that they are preserved for their children and their children's children forever. With their majestic beauty, all unmarred. Theodore Roosevelt. Well, I think the heroes are the ones that you'd sort of at first blush expect if you knew even a little bit about American history. Theodore Roosevelt is important. John Muir, the mountain prophet who sort of screeched up in my consciousness to within the top 10. I mean, he's just about as great as, it, as you get. Franklin Roosevelt. But at the same time, the story that we're telling engages three or four dozen people that you've never heard of before. Amazing human beings from every conceivable uh, walk of life who, in the course of their lives, just felt it was important to save a precious place and, and did so. I can't say I've spent many years and months communing with the Everglades. To be a friend of the Everglades is not necessarily to spend time wandering around out there. It's too buggy, too wet, 
to generally inhospitable. I suppose you could say the Everglades and I have the kind of friendship that doesn't depend on constant physical contact. I know it's out there, and I know it's important. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. We're obviously looking at something bigger than ourselves. I think that we were awakened by doing this project, and we hope that in some ways, the stories that we tell of the people who made the parks, the images that we've gotten back, have been in the spirit of those larger ideas. Our national heritage is richer than just scenic features. The realization is coming that perhaps our greatest national heritage is nature itself. With all its complexity and its abundance of life. George Melendez Wright. George Melendez Wright was a savior of wildlife in America's national parks. But more importantly, George Melendez Wright is a savior of the national park ideal. Our series is filled with heroes. Heroes who are totally unknown to uh, most Americans. People from every conceivable background. Rich people who through their wealth and their philanthropy created parks. Poor people who gave pennies to help save the Great Smokies. A descendant of slaves who helped save Biscayne National Park. Immigrants who fell in love with the place and through their artistry uh, helped bring that place to people's attention. I dedicated my paintings first to the great nature of California, which has always given me great lessons, comfort, and nourishment. Second, to the people who share the same thoughts, as though drawing water from one river under one tree. My paintings, created by the humble brush of a mediocre man, are nothing but expressions of my wholehearted praise and gratitude. Every park has its hero, and I think that is really the heart and soul of this series. Individuals do matter. William Gladstone Steele, in the 1870s, happened to accidentally see a picture of Crater Lake in Oregon in a newspaper that had wrapped his lunchtime meal. And he resolved to go there. And once he did get there, 15 years later, he devoted another 17 years to trying to get it uh, created into a, a national park, which he helped do. Imagine a vast mountain six by seven miles through at an elevation of 8,000 feet with the top removed and the inside hollowed out then filled with the clearest water in the world. And you have a perfect representation of Crater Lake. Everything is a kind of portrait uh, because it's human beings asking these questions. It's human beings saving these places. It's human beings trying to destroy these places. And all of the great stories that this uh, narrative gets caught up in, I think are part of this great human drama. They are islands of hope. The parks are always where I can go home again. I go back to my hometown. There is a Safeway where I used to play with Sylvia Gonzalez. They have taken and turned my old school into a junk shop, but the parks don't do that. So these are places we can always go home and paradoxically, that we can always see into the future and hope for the better things. When we look at parks, and we look at the United States and we examine the whole idea of democracy, 
I think that the park experience is an exploration of the idea of freedom. Where, where do I come from? Where am I going? How did I get here? How did we as a people get here? I think that when people go to a national park, they get a sense, a compass to history. We've frozen to death, <laughs> you know, in below zero weather. We've um, filmed in broiling hot temperatures. It's every extreme. And yet, you know, I don't think there's any of us that ever complained about this, that we didn't feel that we were part of this privileged uh, moment of being able to capture this stuff. I just love these. Just like, you yeah. Fall the ridge line down and Yeah, I right. know, I know, I just did. We have shot in 53 of the 58 national parks. We extended our shooting schedule by about two years for a project of this size, mainly because there are so many places we needed to go. The parks themselves, the places themselves are, in essence, characters in our film. We wanted to be able to interview them as extensively as possible, and some of them we went three different seasons to visit them. We're filming in Denali, and it has only one road. It's 90 miles long, and most of it is dirt and completely unimproved. And, that, and that's the way the park wants it to be. And so you have a sense that this is just your little ribbon of territory. Don't leave this line. This is where you go. And the, the beasts there, the moose, all the other animals, but for me, especially the bear. And in one day where it was in early August, we were pursuing these brown bears in Alaska. And you just, we look at each other and, you know, it's great. In this film, the landscape really is the character. It's one of the characters. It's the main character. I mean, it is a film about the parks. So, you know, thankfully we have this incredible landscape to work with and it's so varied and it's so beautiful. I think the most amazing experience I had was in Hawaii Volcanoes. I was actually shooting handheld out the back door of a helicopter. It started out, we flew up to the top of the crater and we were probably flying 15 feet over the active volcano. And I could feel the heat singeing my feet. It was so hot. We then flew out and over to the coast where this lava, which I think is around 2,000 degrees, is just pouring into the ocean. And as it hits the ocean, it sends up these huge plumes of steam and also the, the lava itself kind of explodes out. During the day, you don't really see the immensity of the lava field. But at night, miles of Earth glow. And to fly over glowing hot red molten Earth is so exciting. It's just an amazing, amazing experience. And, you know, hopefully some of that comes through in the film. Some of our shoots, we hiked long distances. We had a pack train to carry some of our equipment sometimes. We had to trudge through snow. We had to, you know, carry equipment a mile, two miles, sometimes eight miles um, to get the shots that we needed, depending on the park. But on the whole, the Park Service has done such a great job of saying, this is a really good place to stop and look at that mountain peak, or to see this cascade, or just to experience what this park has to offer, that much of what we shot are views that any American family with a park map and a desire to, to see what that park has to offer, they could find too. Whenever someone enters a national park, it's, it's like going to another world. And I think that people feel that transition. They feel that sense that they've gone to someplace better than what they've left behind. 
But the irony is, is that where they've gone is the place where they've always been. It's just now they understand it. Now they see it. Now they feel it. Because parks are like going home. You know, it's funny, you tell people we were working in the national parks and there's some assumptions. And it's sort of like, I know all this before. And you don't, and, and we didn't. And I would wager that it's the best cinematography we've ever done as a collection of filmmakers. But it also represents incredible archival research. Thousands of images from private archival hands. Still photographs of people's scrapbooks that we put together. I had better get to it. Okay, now. And it's delivered us experiences just as filmmakers and uh, as colleagues and friends that I don't think we've ever had on any other production before. One of the greatest moments of my life was a Friday when my dad drove me to Front Royal at the very top of the Skyline Drive in a very modest park, Shenandoah National Park. I spent you know, two magnificent days this weekend, just my dad and me, doing hikes, which I sort of exaggerated into, you know, tens of miles. I'm sure they were a mile and a half hike. Waterfalls that were immense, and I'm sure they were cascades of just a few meters in length, catching salamanders, these bright orange salamanders under the decaying red rod of a log. I mean, that means as much to me as anything else, and that's the heart of these experiences. The experience is who I went with, and that becomes, you know, who that hand is holding. It means a lot. Already the national parks are beneficently affecting the national mind. Nowhere else do people from all the states mingle in quite the same spirit as they do in their national parks. One sits at dinner, say, between a Missouri farmer and an Idaho miner, and at supper between a New York artist and an Oregon shopkeeper. One climbs mountains with a chance crowd from Vermont, Louisiana, and Texas, and sits around the evening campfire with a California grape grower, a locomotive engineer from Massachusetts, and a banker from Michigan. Here, the social differences so insisted on at home just don't exist. Perhaps for the first time, one realizes the common America and loves it. In the national parks, all are just Americans. I think something draws us there. Everybody feels it, the most jaded, a uh, city dweller uh, can't help but, but have their molecules rearranged just a little bit uh, in one of these places. And what's so interesting is that when Thomas Jefferson sort of conceived of our country, he saw this whole place as an Eden. And so he didn't need a national park. He just assumed it would remain in this agrarian kind of pristine state. But that didn't happen. We filled up the continent very quickly. And all of a sudden, we began to experience this anxiety. What if the, we run out of these places? What does it say about ourselves if we let these places go? And I think it animated this impulse to just try to save these places. It's these moments that we all get transformed as we sit in front of this beauty and realize, had we let these places go, we would be a much poorer country. We would be a much poorer people. We need national parks to have people, especially our kids, understand what America is. America is not sidewalks. America is not stores. America is not video games. America is not restaurants. We need national parks so people can go there and say, ah, this is America. The National Parks, America's Best Idea, premieres September 27th, only on PBS. PBS previews the National Parks will continue in a moment. But first...
The National Parks, America's Best Idea, continues online. Sign up for email updates, watch clips, and download screensavers and wallpaper of scenery from the film. It's all online at pbs.org. Major funding for the production of the National Parks was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS stations from viewers like you. Thank you. We are PBS.